How is your memory? Maybe I should wait and ask that next week to see if you remember to set your clocks ahead one hour. How's your memory? You can't remember the last time you were angry? That means you don't get angry that often. You forgot the intense pain of a gallbladder attack? We all like to forget pain. The last two years, a stack of magazines beside your couch or the clutter in your garage or the cobweb hanging from your ceiling, can you forget spring cleaning another year? <laughs> Memory check. Remember the Ten Commandments? No looking at the Old Testament on the back of the bulletin. There are, in fact, more than ten things that are easy to forget from day to day. But there's one thing we always remember, and that's our forgetfulness. We even forget how generous and large-hearted God is. God knows that we, finite, limited, forgetful human beings, we need something solid to hold on to in order to grasp His mercy and His omnipresence. The temple was that place for the Jews. The church is that place for Christ's redeemed people. As the presence of God filled the temple, so this place is the habitation where Christ's glory dwells. It is holy ground where eyes are set on God. We remember. We teach our children to remember. There's a Latin phrase sometimes used by Lutheran Christians that addresses the centrality of worship in the life, identity, and mission of the church. It goes lex orendi, lex credendi, lex vivendi, which literally means the way we worship is what we believe and how we live. Again, the way we worship reflects what we believe and determines how we live. You could say it backwards. How we live shows what we believe and how we pray or how we worship. We want visitors to remember. I imagine, as you do, there are many places that are much quieter than in years past. Even the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, revered as the site of Jesus' crucifixion and burial, is limiting tour groups and visitors and pilgrims and worshipers this year. They are suggesting that physical contact be avoided, that social distancing. We, we know those terms already. They are our everyday language. We can imagine what it might be in those places in the Holy Land. Perhaps quiet, quieter places than in other years. It wasn't a time of pandemic in Jerusalem that day. There were crowds of pilgrims who had come up for the Passover. It was anything but quiet. Anything but worship going on in the temple. It was a chaotic, not the sound of prayer and praise, but the deafening clamor of money changers and pigeons and oxen and sheep and not the smell of incense. The most holy place on earth 
at the most holy time of the year, the Passover, a foul scene indeed. Twice. First, toward the end of the first half of today's gospel, John 2, verse 17, we read, His disciples remembered. Again, toward the end of the second half of the gospel, we read, His disciples remembered. They remembered the words from Psalm 69, Zeal for your house has consumed me. They remembered after, after Jesus had risen from the dead, they remembered him saying, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. His disciples remembered. They remembered the day Jesus' anger raged in the temple. An angry love, a jealous love, not an not a anger that, that sprung from hatred, but an anger springing from the love of God, the love for his people. The disciples remembered that Jesus' love that brought him pain and suffering and death on the cross. The disciples remembered Jesus' spring cleaning day in the temple. When we remember the priorities of this place, and our focus on the presence of God here. We don't forget the point of Jesus in the temple. John's Gospel begins by saying the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Literally, God tabernacled. God pitched His tent among us. Jesus is the Word, the temple where God, not a small God, meets his creation. King Herod and the money changers and the Jews during the Passover missed the point of the temple. How's your memory? The temple was a wonder to behold. Forty-six years in the making. Filled with marble and majestic finery. Destroyed in A.D. 70, never again rebuilt. The world is full of chapels and churches and temples. Even the smallest of towns with only two traffic lights has at least three. But at the heart of the Jerusalem temple, God dwelt and was known there. The reason that can't be overstated is that Jesus identifies himself as the temple. Jesus is the presence of God among his people. Part of the significance is that when John's gospel was written, it was only a few decades after the destruction of the temple. First century Jews were still trying to find out, trying to figure out how to get along without a temple. When Jesus said, destroy this temple, he was pointing to the connection to God found only through him. Not encased in marble and mortar, but in him. Jesus says, look at me. To my body, to my flesh and my blood, the dwelling and the presence of God. Did you come here this morning? And will you come back next week remembering that? Does this place put you in mind that you are saved not because of putting in pew time, but in the death of Jesus and because God in His grace opens our eyes to His presence, His eternal love, His remembering our sins no more through the cross, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Remember, what needs to be done for our salvation has been done in the death of Jesus on the cross. The temple that was destroyed and in three days raised again.
Remember. Remember. In John's Gospel, the purification of the temple comes on the heels of Jesus' first sign or miracle at the wedding in Cana, where he turned water into wine, showing his power to purify and provide. His disciples remembered how Zechariah, the prophet, pointed to the day when God would purify the temple. And you can do no better than to leave here remembering. Remembering. Trusting what Jesus says about his death and resurrection. Remembering your faith in the one true God rather than the small gods of your own devising. Remembering the falsehood and the trap set for you by the small gods, from which the one true God, the temple himself, turns the tables and sets you free. For afterwards, for after that moment in the gospel, there was talk about what happened that day in the temple at meetings in the high priest's chamber at the Jerusalem Chamber of Commerce, Jesus' actions didn't make him popular with the powers that be. And his love, his love and his mercy that takes the form of a cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who yield to the wisdom of the cross, the wisdom of God, the weakness that saves, remember the foundation and the power for the praise we raise. In the name of the Father, whose good and wise law revives our lives and opens our eyes. In the name of the Son who turns the tables of our hearts and cleanses us from every stain. In the name of the Holy Spirit who in holy baptism has sanctified your body and mind to be his temple.